Hello and welcome. I'm Samantha Rollins, Bustle's Deputy Entertainment Editor, and I'm here today with the cast and creators of I Hate Susie, which is streaming now on HBO Max. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce everyone. We have co-creator and writer Lucy Preble, co-creator and star Billy Piper, Daniel Ings, who plays Susie's husband, Cobb, and Layla Farzad, who plays Susie's best friend and manager, Naomi. Hi guys, thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Um, Hello. So I'll get right to it. Um, the inciting incident of the show is a hack when photos of Susie, who's a B-list celebrity, are published on the internet showing her being intimate with someone who is definitely not her husband. Um, Lucy and Billy, why did you decide, decide to start the show with a hack? That was Lucy's idea. <laughs> <laughs> nice, uh, <laughs> nice passing the ball, Belle. Um, I am... Um, I guess part of it was that I didn't feel like we'd ever seen anything like that before. Um, there'd been a lot of it in real life, obviously back in around 2014 and 2016, there were major hacks of, and, and you know, people's private property was stolen, would be another way of putting it, from their phones um, and their external um, memory sources. And I thought that must have a huge impact on people's lives. Firstly, obviously emotionally, which is what drama's interested in. So that was kind of compelling, but also professionally and financially and in all sorts of unexpected ways. And so I was kind of surprised that there hadn't been a big thing about it. And also there was very little even in the news about the consequences of it, presumably because the victims themselves were advised to or didn't want to speak about it. It draws more attention to it, leads to people searching more for those images. And also professionally, you might not really want that to be a part of your what you're known for. So I understand all the reasons for that, but it was a curiously silent third act to that story. Um, what I find interesting is that celebrity isn't the focus of the series, even though it starts with a hack, but it kind of acts as an interesting lens for magnifying what could be like the average woman's struggles, so to speak. Um, Billy, as someone who's been in the public eye for as long as Susie has or longer, uh, was there anything you particularly wanted to include or avoid in portraying some of the less savory aspects of fame? Um, well, uh, I think we, we, I think we covered a lot of, a lot of ground. Um, no, I was very much up for um, uh, discussing all of it um, in a way that felt very, very um, honest and, um, and very revealing, even if that was at times um, uncomfortable. There was nothing that I, um, I felt that we, we couldn't or shouldn't discuss. Um, um, we just wanted uh, to make sure that, yeah, um, to make sure that, um, well, it was everything we understood about the industry, everything we understood about hacking. And we did some work around that. We did we did a fair amount of research, and I know Lucy did a, a great deal, and we both spoke to a few people um, together and independently. Um, but it was just a, it was just a quest to just you know be quite brazen and quite bold um, uh, in a way that helped us tell our story um, but wasn't sort of disingenuous or, or for a you know shock factor I suppose. Yeah it was a also the celebrity thing was a bit of a trick I suppose to haul people in like as in pulling the very same trick that the the whole show is about which is to go oh look, this is a shiny person allegedly, but actually the show is really about just a woman who has this traumatic thing happen to her, but has terrible coping mechanisms and is also herself very flawed. And that, you know, that's a little bit like how the whole industry operates, which is, you know, look at this shiny thing over here. And now we're actually going to look at something hopefully much more interesting and uh, meaningful. Yeah, at it first was we were quite at first we were quite anxious about um giving her that uh the the profile of a, a famous person but i think in the end what something that we discussed a lot was this idea that on some level everybody has a profile now um just through being online on social media and just by having a smartphone to some extent. And so it it wasn't, you know, it, it felt uh, like a familiar 
I, I imagine it would feel like a familiar stress should it happen to to anybody else. It, it didn't really matter that she was famous. It just meant that we could open up the world a lot more. Yeah, but it's all it's all incriminating whether whether you're famous or not, you know. Yeah, it definitely felt like there were just moments that um, were probably things that you heavily researched or felt um, were like things that you've experienced in terms of like the Comic Con scene. I don't know if it was technically Comic Con, but um, and you know, speaking of the damage control interview with the journalist, things like that that rang very true. But the show wasn't necessarily about that on a large scale. It was more about a woman kind of just like making a mess and continuing to to dig in deeper. Yeah. Um, yeah. Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Hey. Um, at the point where we meet Cobb and Susie, uh, their marriage already seems less than ideal, I would say. Um, I found it kind of hard to even imagine like what their what their life was like together when they were happy. How did you put yourself <laughs> how, how did you put yourself in his mindset? You're you're meeting this character when it seems like he's already not at his best. Yeah, well we did I did a bit of sort of um, research with our director Georgie, kind of plotting out who these people would have been um, 10 years before, 15 years before. And I think there's something, um, there were a few clues in the script. Some of them didn't, didn't make it into the show actually, but, but I think were still useful um, about who, basically who they were when they met, you know, when they were, when they were younger. And I think there's something about, um, not just guys actually, but people who are sort of contrarians, who are the kind of people who will always, um, call out bullshit and and sort of um uh not take any shit from people that when you're like 22 is very attractive do you know what i mean when when you were like particularly there's a lot of guys that are um take so much pride in that when you're like 19 20 and you're all students but then by the time that you've got a life together and you you have kind of boring functional things that you have to do together um like the intricacies of raising a child or dealing with each other's dealing with the in-laws or whatever that actually that that person can become an incredibly difficult human being to live with and I think the other thing that happens is like as enough time passes you start to sort of um uh, I don't want this to be too revealing about my own marriage which is which I'm <laughs> uh, but like but you but, but you but you you start to kind of control each other in these little ways you know you start to get your hooks into each other and it's gradual it doesn't happen like we we join this marriage at a point where it's it's like you say it's sort of desperately unhappy but you can you can coast along in that space for a really long time do you know what I mean you can you can develop coping mechanisms and actually codependencies that mean it takes sometimes it takes an event as extreme as the inciting incident of this show to sort of shine the spotlight on those um, uh, sometimes kind of horrific situations that you've got into as a couple. Uh, I, I didn't want to be really. <laughs> 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 He's right. He's right. Yeah, I found it interesting, um, and I liked that it wasn't overt, but it, you you know maybe a little bit more at the beginning. You definitely felt like maybe he um he maybe he resents Susie just in terms of like their 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 jobs and and being a breadwinner um but sort of like how her job doesn't look like the typical maybe breadwinner job um and things like that Lucy I'm curious writing Cobb he could so easily be just like a like a villain um but he's a lot more complex what were you thinking about when you were writing him um I was thinking about trying to write a man well as in this particular character, obviously, but also, you know, I'm, I'm not a man and I, 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 I need what? to think carefully. <laughs> I've got to, you know, use my imagination. And I sort of, I, I actually have a lot of sympathy for Cobb. I think the situation that he finds himself in is really awful and traumatic in its own way. And it just so happens that his his coping mechanisms are not performative like Susie's are and manipulative. His are aggressive and kind of um, and defensive at the same time, and and also a sort of righteous fury. And that's just like that's just you know part of who he is. And and also he's a kind of he's a big guy, so those things will have been useful for him in the past in a way that they aren't useful for a small petite woman. And we look at that in episode three, fear a little bit. So it makes sense as why people have developed these mechanisms. So I, I have a lot of sympathy for him, 
but I also was, you know, I was, I was kind of amused and interested in looking at the kind of, I think he has a view of himself as being a very, very good family man, a really good dad, and he is a really good dad. Those things are kind of true, but they're sort of important. They're much more important to him. His view of himself is more important to him, maybe than the happiness of anyone around him or the, um, or even being, or being kind or anything like that. It's more in, in a similar way to Susie, actually, it's slightly constructed from the outside. And when, um, and, and so like her, he needs a moment that's the, like this inciting incident does represent to shine a light on that, like Dan was saying, and to go, are you really a, this good husband and this good dad? Or are you, you know, kind of resentful, belittling and uh, a little bit obsessed with exterior things just as much as Susie is? So, you know, he has he has that to him. But I, and I also just wanted it to be. There's a lot of writing from a woman's point of view of men where they're either very, very just wonderful guys and you think, oh, why doesn't, you know, they should get together, he's so great. Or there's a guy who's clearly an absolute, you know, either a, either a villain or very weak and kind of laughable. And I, I, saw, I, I, I was trying to find something that felt that, had a, that, that felt more rounded than that, even though, you know, he is also a force of, he's not necessarily a force for good. <laughs> Definitely. And um, speaking of codependency, uh, Layla, time to talk about Naomi. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, what I kind of, I loved about um, Susie and Naomi's friendship is you don't realize that it's kind of codependent and a little bit toxic at first. Um, at first, at least when I was watching it the first couple episodes, it seems like they're really maybe a little bit more opposites attract they uh, kind of counterbalance each other. Um, and we don't realize until the end that it's like, maybe we're just not seeing it from Naomi's point of view and she's given so much of herself up. Um, what do you think of their friendship and, and what did you like, um, what did you discover while, while portraying it? Um, <clears throat> well, I think by the end of episode two, you can feel that there's a, there's a real, uh, there's a problem there, isn't there? Um, I. I liked um, how honest and true it was um, as a friendship portrayal. I think, um, like Lucy was saying about men, I think female friendship is often not portrayed in its true, ugly, codependent form. <laughs> um, and a bit like what Dan was saying about if you've been together for a very long time, if you've been friends for a very long time, I think you find yourself in a very particular dynamic with a friend um, where you are the one that fixes stuff and she is the one that messes up and you are the one that answers her calls and she is the one that splurges out all her problems to you and you listen and then you hang up and you feel empty and resentful but perhaps you don't tell her because that's just the way it's always been. And so I think we meet um, Susie and Naomi at this crossroads where Naomi has started to become aware of that and aware of her unhappiness and the fact that Susie is um, is so much to her, but too, it's too much. Susie is her world, is her client, is her best friend, is her sister, is the family that raised her, is, is everything. And it's time for her to break away and see who she is by herself. But it takes her a while to get there. Um, so yeah, it was, it was very, very, um, it was fascinating the journey to go on. Um, Lucy and Billy, I know that you've mentioned before that the idea for this show maybe started out a little bit more as a friendship show. Um, and I'm curious, I guess, like the seeds of that, um, what were you thinking when, when it started that way in terms of like what you wanted to portray in this central friendship? I think it was probably in its first, um, in the first draft, it was, it was, it was sort of mirroring more closely what we had been going through personally maybe um or, or what our friendship had become um <clears throat> which was you know it was sort of i don't know like i feel like it's five it was five years of a lot of counseling each other through um our late 20s into our early 30s which which felt very significant for me and um, I think for Lucy too um, uh, and and so I think it, it did sort of mimic that um, in a way that was fun and and 
brilliant because Lucy had written it, but in a way that felt maybe conceptually something we'd been used to um, seeing. And that's when uh, Lucy came up with the idea of the hack. Um, and then that sort of changed everything really. Yeah, um, I think, I, you know, I, I was interested in all the things that Layla is talking about. We were both really interested in the ideas of where love meets codependency. And, you know, I don't I don't think there is an either or, you know, it's, it's interesting how so many descriptions of this show, you, people do sort of go, oh, we thought they were really good friends, but actually it's quite toxic. And you're like, those things are not in opposition to each other. You know, none, none of those things are binary separates. They're all... Um, necessary parts of being very intimate with somebody is is going oh god and we've crossed over that line again and now I feel really uncomfortable and it's just like constant management of that in life um, and I think the uh, yeah so there was there was a lot of interest there and also the sort of odd couple element of someone who's more emotional and maybe more outward facing and smiley and someone who's more cerebral and nervous and negative and how they both um, you know, help each other out in the world, but also maybe uh, annoying to each other. But that wasn't enough. You know, that's like, that's, there's been a thousand things that look at dynamics like that. And um, I just, I just always was like, I want I, I want us to do a show that no one's ever done before and to have characters that people haven't really seen before. And I do think that um, Cobb and Naomi and Susie are all quite interesting you know, nuanced characters, um, mostly in, well, partly, partly the writing, but mostly because of how they've been played by these guys. Yeah. Um, I also find it interesting just in concept, um, you know, you had mentioned like that a friendship show, the friendship show had sort of been done before. Um, and I think some of that is like, you put all these shows in a box of like the 20 something friendship show. And to me, this felt like this sort of the secret 30 something aim, aimlessness uh, that that people don't talk about of like you have a life and you have all these things and you don't maybe some some of these characters in particular aren't necessarily interrogating how they got there um and I know that you guys have spoken a lot about Susie not knowing what she wants or not knowing that she doesn't know that um and I think it's really interesting um with Naomi too that she, she ends up sort of in the same place um on her journey with journey um uh you know realizing that she may not want kids and she thought she did um what was it like to play that storyline that was one of the something very interesting that i felt i hadn't seen uh portrayed in that way the, the storyline of her are you talking are you asking me yes yeah oh did i say uh, i don't this, know if that's wrong yeah 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 no that's fine uh the storyline of her sort of em emancipation from susie is that what you mean yeah, and, and also um, thinking that she wants kids and then realizing that... Oh, kids um, I yeah. think that's a long overdue topic that has not been examined truthfully and properly, um, partly because this age isn't really looked at that much in mm -hmm. on television. I feel like we have euphoria and we have girls and we have mm -hmm. the younger... We, we examine the, the younger female psyche, what's going on, but something stops people from looking at women in their mid to late thirties, um, which is when the child flag starts to really like be flapped in your face and people are really asking questions and you ask yourself the questions and then people around you are popping out babies and you have to, you know, have that big conversation, which is um, so impossible. And how on earth are we to know whether we'll be good mothers, if we should be mothers, you know, um, whether we'll enjoy it, um, so I think um, I felt very privileged to have that as one of her stories, as one of Naomi's storylines. Um, and I think it's something that should be more prominent on television generally. Um, I wanna ask you guys all something. Um, so I guess Lucy, I'll start with you. Um, I'm curious, what was like the hardest thing about um, in your case, either writing, creating the show or filming the show, like what was a big, um, one of the, the biggest challenges and maybe hopefully one of the biggest rewards of it? Um, you know, a particular scene or a particular character or something like that? Um, I found, I found just writing the first episode very difficult because I did, I did, I did a lot of drafts. I mean, dozens of drafts of the first episode. 
Um, and it went all the way from it being a friendship show through to lots of different versions of what you see now. And I think that's a, that, that's simply a kind of horrible trying to find it thing. And I have to go through the process of writing it to find it. And, to, and, and, and once you've written it, go, oh, no, it's not that. Oh, no, damn. And then try another thing. And I, I so wish there was a way to just sort of flick through that in one's head um, before doing it and then and then to be able to start writing knowing what it is but I guess maybe a bit like the characters in the show I don't really know what I want until I've made the mistake <laughs> and then I go oh no I didn't want that I want this so so that was that was kind of grueling um, and also Billy and I had really wanted us to find the show ourselves before we took it out to people so that we weren't then in a situation of being at the behest of their vision so that was a lot of time spent working on it without um without knowing if it would happen or anything like that. Without so being paid. That quite, without being paid, it's <laughs> kind of what I meant to say, <laughs> but felt too, uh, too polite to say. Um, uh, and, and, and also it was, you know, no, it was quite a, um, it was quite a pressured shoot. Like it was very, very, um, you know, uh, yeah, it was, it was very fast and it was very, um, yeah, pressured. I, but, yeah, I've I've been really, really most moved by seeing the performers perform. Like as uh, these actors are brilliant actors and brought so much more to the roles than I ever imagined. Um, and then their performances meeting the audience. Um, my very favourite, you know, with a show like this, I just thought it was so weird and so um, aggressive in places and so uh, tonally deliberately you know inconsistent but totally different episode to episode I thought well some people will love this but some people will just be like absolutely not what are you doing and there has to, of course there's always a bit of that but there's so many people who've got it like who feel like they've completely really really got it and feel quite grateful for it and I'm just so grateful for that it makes you feel a lot less insane you know <laughs> um, when you're writing something that's quite extreme and other people don't react to it like it's extreme they react to it like it makes them less alone and that's the whole point so yeah, that probably. Was there any particular moment you said you wrote drafts and drafts that things like clicked into place for you? Yeah, when I was writing it, it was the wank episode. It was episode four. And there was something about it that just relaxed me. <laughs> <laughs> so when, that, as in, I was like, if I'm doing this, if, if, if we're writing a show which has an episode right in the center of it, which all takes place in her head when she's masturbating, then this show can and must go anywhere. And I remember from that point on in the writing, I was really, I stopped thinking, what would it, what does, what, what does a television show look like? What would it look like if it was a television show? And I just completely put that aside and started thinking, what do we want to see next? What do I want to see next? And, and, and really took away any sense of rules from it. And an episode four really allowed that to happen, I think. Um, and, and yeah, on a, on a more boring technical level, when the rushes were coming in from episode one, at the end of the day, each day, it became rapidly clear what we were doing and what we were building. And there was a couple of things that I wanted to just to reshoot because I suddenly realized, oh, it's not that, it's this. And, the, and everyone was kind enough to do that. It was very, very, very small section, but it was very important in the first 10 minutes. And that was another moment where I was like, oh, okay, we know what this show is now. That's what we go towards. Mm. Billy, what about you, either in playing Susie or in helping create the show, some of your challenges? Um, uh, it's funny, Lucy and I were talking about this on the phone the other day, um, and the, the I find the filming, I found the filming of it challenging, but also there were moments that I... Um, I loved playing, obviously, and also being on set with one of my oldest friends. That was very meaningful to me. And creatively, we're very similar and we lean into the same things. And that, you know, to work in that way um, was a bit of a revelation to me. Um, so that felt good. But just logistically, the sort of the, and practically the filming is is hard. Um, 
you know, I'd, I'd not long had a baby, so I was at work and that felt, um, you know, as, as, as it always does, um, quite strained and quite panicky. And I'm sure all of that sort of fed into the work in a sort of helpful way, but it, mm-hmm. it, it, it's not particularly nice to experience. But, and also just because I was also an exec on the show. Um, so we were doing a lot of work on set that you wouldn't be doing ordinarily as an actor um for hire which means which means that you can't you're not available to anyone really at all um uh so those were the moments that I struggled with um the most sort of broadly speaking but but like Lucy the the upsides of that that sort of struggle um I mean post-production in lockdown also (laughs) Had its challenges. <laughs> but the the upside of um the struggle is this sort of what f- this feedback um from men from men but mostly women um about how familiar this character and this these circumstances feel um this that's just so rewarding because you know we had sort of reservations about how far we wanted to go how abstract we wanted to be how tonally different as Lucy said we we wanted to go and and you know that's that's frightening um when you're creating things but for that to to work and pay off and for for people to be moved by it and feel um feel a connection is is oh god it's like the, it's the greatest thing ever it, it's the most rewarding prof- professional feeling ever and 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 bill to be specific as well the end of episode five was quite a struggle right i mean just Hang practically on, speaking oh Bargaining. yeah i mean yeah but, okay so specifically yeah that was a nightmare um the, the when i'm being um i'm i'm in the ground being disemboweled by all the zombies yeah yeah because the because (laughs) like in the weeks leading up to that like a a few weeks leading up to that I was sort of being asked by producers and our director Anthony Nielsen you know how how are you going to feel about being in a ground in uh, in in a box in the ground and I was like it's fine look I think everyone's being quite hysterical about this and I'm not precious. I'm fine with stuff like this. Because you're um, buried. Then, she's buried underground, apart from her head, obviously. Yeah. So it's just exactly. So it's head to here, and then the rest is like a prosthetic body, and you know, kind of pad, padded out legs. Um, uh, and anyway, so I I was getting quite cross about the endless um, tr- chat about this this day of shooting, and it turns out that the day of shooting, having said I'd be absolutely fine, I had my first panic attack on set um uh yeah which was um which we filmed <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which we used because which that's the kind of show we are um in yeah. a sort of like exec producer head space um I sort of going, oh, fine, this is quite good though <laughs> oh but it's so strange um but it, it's one of my favorite scenes in the show I think it sort of perfectly depicts what it feels like to be female (laughs) so you use that take oh there's loads of me in there having a genuine meltdown I mean it's not hysterical it's very um composed um and private which is you know how I think it it, it, well how it feels um Layla what about you uh, Which, a, a cha- a, like one of your your challenges or a hard scene to shoot or, or something that um you know you um, really have to get, get through on the show uh I think uh I found the um uh Lucy's dialogue needs to come out very very fast because <laughs> it's um, and and you can never be too fast and I sometimes meander and take my time and uh, so I had to learn to up my pace this is like my personal so especially on the phone acting is harder than it looks Um, and Naomi is always on the phone Um, so I um, was challenged by the phone acting and I often had Lucy on the other end of the phone um, reading in the other the other lines uh, to help me and so I found that challenging and when I watch it back I realize god how important it is to keep up the pace and the momentum of this um especially the first few episodes which are so sort of 
um, high octane. So I, I found that um, challenging, but but rewarding at the end. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, it's it's fun. I I just think I think back generally with real real fondness. Apart from the kind of obviously, like they said, it was you know there was there was pressure. There was occasional time pressure, and that was. Um, <laughs> Um, for someone that was not particularly uh, experienced uh, behind, uh, you know, in camera acting, I, I had my own personal challenges, but we got through and um, very proud of the result. Now you can do lots of lots of phone acting. Really, really. Do, yeah, I'm, I'm around for phone acting. <laughs> now yeah. she's like this. Which, yeah. is, which is lucky, given the, uh, <laughs> given the yeah. current state of the film industry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Daniel, what about you? Um, I think maybe a couple of things. I, rem I remember our director Georgie sort of saying to me quite early on, like in the maybe even in the audition process. Like I, I, um, I've I sort of mostly come from a comedy background. This there's not like I've done much more comedy than drama, and Lucy scripts are so like there's so so many um comic potential comic beats in there and i think i think as 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 lucy and billy have both pointed out sort of tonally the show goes to so many places and that that, that wasn't that hadn't like entirely been settled on as we were like it kind of came to life as we were making it and i guess m one of my instincts is to like is to maybe lean into that and i remember georgie saying to me in the audition like you're not allowed to i don't she was i can't remember the, the example but she was like, I don't want you to do any, like no comic beats, no comic timing. No, she was sort of like trying to like hammer that out of me, which I found very difficult. I sort of got into it as, as it went on. Um, but I'm a ham really, I'm, I'm a big old ham. And I just wanted to kind of lean into, <laughs> lean into that. And the other thing I suppose more generally was that Georgie often wanted to shoot things multiple ways. So you'd like, you'd do a, you know, you'd do a scene with like six or seven setups in it. And she'd be like, I want you to do this scene as if like Cobb's really calm and happy and everything's going his way. Now I want you to do the, uh, do the next one. Like he's kind of, you know, just done a line of Coke before he came in or whatever, whatever it was. And so we were constantly sort of shooting these, these like really like juicy lengthy scenes from, from sort of multiple perspectives. And it became, it was a real challenge, like, um, personally sort of threading the needle so that you could make it all make sense in the in the various different setups and I think actually that's a that's a huge credit to to um because it's all there on the page like the the writing is there but it's so rich you can do it a bunch of different ways and I think it's a, it's a real credit as well to Georgie and uh, and Anthony and the editors and and Billy and Lucy in the edit kind of extrapolating this story from all the raw material um particularly yeah. in lockdown because it's you know I think that's a Sorry, I, was just, I think that's, I've not thought about that down the pages. Like that's a really good point. I I was quite aware that we had, we had a, a, a large number of women head of departments, like almost all actually, I think, um, women head of departments. And I was quite struck by how, it was, it was interesting to me how open the process was in every single way and how it was kept very open for very long periods of time. So a bit like Dan saying, like having lots of different versions of a scene is really, really great. But, but at some point you really need to shut it down because you can't, nothing can be everything always. Um, but I was really struck by how in almost every department, things were very, very open for quite a long time, I think, before you know, like that moment we had with the rushes where I was like, no, 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 we need to reshoot these two because now I can really see what this is. And and also in the edit, episode four, particularly the masturbation episode was really, you know, was so like, you, you've got someone's mind who can go anywhere in that episode. So how do you decide what it is you're choosing? Um, and I, I did think there was something quite female about that and something that the show, you know, with each of its different colors in each episode, each of its different tones in each episode was also trying to do, um, which was just not, not do one thing along a straight line continually, but to actually keep showing different sort of faces of the diamond or something, or as it were. And for, from, for, for, from an acting perspective, it's like, I'm a bit of a control freak and I, I'll, I'll, I'll regularly come into work, like pretty much having plotted out like the sort of cadence and the rhythm of how I'm going to deliver certain lines so it's quite like um 
exposing. I really had to like relinquish myself to the process in a way to say, yeah. I don't know what this performance is going to look like in the edit because there's multiple different um, versions of it. And it was, you know. Um, it's quite frightening, I guess. It's, fr it's frightening. I mean, I was, I was all in, like it was an exciting thing. Cause mm. I, like I said, I just don't, I'm not, I don't normally work like that. Mm. Um, and it, but it, re it required a sort of greater deal of trust really. And like the proof is, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, isn't it? And I think just the show works so brilliantly. And like there was so, the joy of it was like watching it and seeing and being surprised by it. You know what I mean? Being surprised by like scenes that you were a part of making or putting together. Um, Georgie so, won, yeah, it won over our trust, didn't you think? I thought Georgie kept, was like, trust me a lot of the time, our director. Cause I go, I, I don't, she was like, no, it's fine. Move on. <laughs> like, okay. I'm, I'm, and she was right to just, you know, yeah, like do a few different versions and then it, it was in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, another thing that I really liked um, is that Susie and Cobb's son is deaf, but it's not treated as like a storyline. It's just treated as a simple fact. He's there, there are mentions of it. Um, Lucy, I'm curious, um, what inspired that choice? Um, honestly, it just, it came out of, a few things one is I've got a deaf friend she um you know she would sometimes talk about things that had happened in her childhood that were kind of funny and unexpected to do with her being basically using it to get away with stuff a lot of the time pretending that she didn't understand something when she really did and and using other people's sympathies in order to get away with stuff as a little kid and I always I always thought about that at the back of my head as a writer being like that's good because that's really unexpected because you automatically always think oh you know that the person who is you know differently abled is 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 is, is has, you has to be good or has to be a victim in some way and thematically with our show we're really interested in it not being that and so I was like oh it'd be quite interesting to do to have a child in something who was just you know a bit of a shit or a bit mischievous um who was deaf and then and also just the list you know the list of things that we put up on the board when we were creating the show one of the lists was entitled you know things you see a lot in life but you never see on television. And at that point, I hadn't really ever seen much deaf representation, unless it was, as you say, like a short movie about a deaf person um, and about, you know, very particularly about the fact that they're deaf. And that's not how you encounter deaf people in life. You know, you encounter them in all sorts of ways at work or on transport or in your family. It's not, you don't encounter them um, on the line along about them being deaf. And so that sort of fitted on that board. And also I think we were interested in having a child who didn't just feel like, um, it, felt, it felt like there could be an issue that maybe the parents, because we were very interested in looking at the marriage, might have a disagreement about um, in some way. And, you know, a very, very small thread or, 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 or a facet in the show is that I think they deal with his deafness differently. Um, Susie expects him and wants him to lip read because that's how he will understand most people in the world. So she's got a good argument for that. Whereas Cobb's very keen for them all to learn sign language, to speak his language, as it were, to get onto his level and for him to go to a school like that. And, and just, you know, so that's a potential for a conflict, which is always good for drama. Yeah. But it was really, really something I hadn't seen before. Um, so my last question, um, the show ends with what could be considered a cliffhanger. Um, Lucy, have you thought about what would happen to Susie in a potential season two, should there be one? So we're talking about it at the moment. Um, we're talking about what that looks like. Um, Lucy, sorry if you can hear me and see that your face <laughs> is talking on your behalf. Um, um, but something that's really, that keeps coming up and is very important for us is that we continue to make a show that um, feels, um, that we have content to put into the show, that we're not just, that this, the, the show, the story, the characters have legs, that we're not just spinning out storylines because there's pressure to jump on top of um, what has, you know, thankfully been a success success um in in our view um so it's you know it, it we're we're working out what that is and what that looks like at the moment um and we're not going to rush and we're um because you know Susie is a culmination of seven years five seven or five five seven years of our lives 
um, and discussions and, and things that we've seen and experiences that we've shared. Um, and so it's not really that easy to just um, whip that out again, you know, um, and, and we want to keep pushing forward formally and we want the ideas to be bigger and bolder and that sort of stuff doesn't happen overnight. Um, so there isn't any urgency from us, but there is some urgency from other people. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll see, I think we'll see at this point. Um, well, yeah, I definitely hope that there is more of this great show when you have some yeah, time. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think there will be ultimately. It's just when and what. Yeah. Um, well, Billy and Lucy, who is not here, and Layla and Daniel, thank you so much for speaking with me. It was a lovely chat. And have a great day. Have a great night, day. Have a good one. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Thank you so much. <clears throat>